It's really a, a treat to be here with you as you open the National Conference of State Legislators, Legislatures for the 2013 Legislative Summit. And I thank you very much for uh, welcoming me here today. As a former Arizona legislator, I really appreciate the chance to be among all of you. I know what you go through. And I have a lot of respect for the work that the National Conference of State Legislatures does to try to ensure quality and effectiveness of state legislative bodies and the work that each of you do to ensure this in your own state. So thank you for being here today and letting me join you. I'm going to talk about two things today that are near and dear to my heart in this connection. One is how do we get fair courts in our states? And the other is how do we increase civics education for our young people. Now, I've devoted a lot of my time since I <clears throat> retired from the Supreme Court um, to promote both of these concepts. And I'm going to talk first about fair courts and a few threats to that ideal. Then I'm going to talk briefly about how civics education can minimize threats to our system. At the heart of the ideal of fair courts in our states is the rule of law. And under the rule of law, we expect judges to follow the law as it is, not as it should be or how we think it should be changed or even how the public thinks it should be. Um, Judges have to follow what, in fact, is the law at the time they have to decide the issue. And fulfilling that role, frankly, has a tendency to make judges pretty unpopular at times. You may have noticed in your own states, you can't please all of the people all of the time, and that's especially true for judges. They're constantly disappointing at least half the people that come before them and somebody has to lose. But it's even worse when it comes to public opinion because the rule of law often requires judges to do the opposite of what uh, the majority of the public at the time might want to have happen. At least in the hard cases, the best judges are those who are willing to displease uh, perhaps most of the people most of the time, believe it or not. But we have to learn to appreciate judges for what they do and not attack every judge who issues a decision with which we might disagree. And there's nothing wrong with criticizing judges. Judges are people and they make mistakes, especially when they rule in politically noteworthy cases. We expect the press and the public to want to discuss the decisions made in the courts. But I think we can worry about the tenor of that con conversation. And it seems to me that discussion these days about courts and judges is a bit more politicized, even at lower court levels. I see judges being evaluated like legislators are celebrated or censored for their positions on the issues rather than for their judgment or temperament. And I think this attitude does represent a serious concern for fair courts. And the reason isn't hard to see. Judges who are routinely attacked as activists or partisans by one side or the other, I hope they don't begin to think of themselves as belonging to one side or the other. That only increases the public's perception of partiality. And I think a vicious cycle can erode judicial impartiality and raise the stakes of judicial selection. <clears throat> I think we should try very hard in all our states not to increase the politicization of the process of selecting judges. Citizens have to be taught to recognize that there are great judges 
who do not share all their views about the law of the citizens, in part so that judges will try to be celebrated according to their judicial abilities and not for their political credentials. And it is a problem that many in our country do think of judges as politicians in robes. And I'm concerned that some of the ways we select our state judges contribute to that. Take judicial elections, for example. 22 states today use contested elections to choose their Supreme Court justices. <clears throat> and in my view, that need to raise money for judicial elections to compete in those elections presents one of the greatest threats we have to fair courts. And that threat is increasing rather than diminishing. The first judicial race that cost more than a million dollars took place about 30 years ago in Texas. At the time, we used to think of one million dollars as an obscene amount for some judicial election race. But by today's standard, it's pocket change. From 2000 to 2009, fundraising by candidates for state Supreme Courts surged to nearly $207 million, more than double the amounts raised in the 90s. <coughs> in 2004, a single race for a district-based seat on the Illinois Supreme Court cost just over $9 million. And you probably will not be surprised to learn that the winner of that race received his largest contributions from a company that had an appeal pending at the time before the Illinois Supreme Court. Now, I'm distressed that similar trends have recently been in states that have retention elections, which we've always argued are less of a concern. In retention ele elections, judges run unopposed on their judicial records. And they're the most common feature of the, what we call merit selection process, a process that is designed to preserve judicial impartiality while ensuring public accountability. But even retention elections have become more costly and more politicized. In 2010, justices faced retention challenges in four states, and in those states, more than $4.5 million was spent. And that's more than twice as much as was spent nationwide on those races in the previous decade. And in a single state, Florida, in 2012, this four-state spending figure was surpassed. Florida spent $5.5 million that year in those judicial races. Now, judicial elections powered by money and special interests create the impression, rightly or wrongly, that judges are accountable to money and to special interests, not the law. And the polls of the public consistently show that three-fourths of the public believe that judges are influenced by campaign contributions in their decision-making. Some studies suggest that this, in fact, may be the case that judges may make decisions in order to benefit supporters of past campaigns or attract supporters for future campaigns, or both. State legislatures around the country have taken some steps to address these concerns, including moving from partisan elections to nonpartisan elections and to establishing public financing for judicial races. Strengthening campaign financing and disclosure laws and requiring recusal in cases involving campaign supporters. Now, those efforts are good. We should make them. But I don't think they address the underlying problem adequately. While we expect other elected officials to take the views of their campaign supporters into account, our judges should never be, or shouldn't be seen to be, beholden to any constituency. That's not what we expect from our judges. And the primary alternative to electing our judges 
is to have a process of what we call merit selection. With merit selection of judges, there's a commission of lawyers and non-lawyers to screen applicants and to recommend the best qualified candidates for judicial positions. And I served in the Arizona legislature when my home state adopted a merit selection proposal, which we put before the voters for them to vote on. And merit selection was approved that year by the voters in Arizona by a pretty narrow margin. And merit selection is also used in, for Supreme Court justices in 22 states in the United States at present. But it has its critics. Legislators in a handful of states are among those critics. And they say the process is dominated by the plaintiff's bar, by lawyers representing the plaintiff's bar, or by political elites, or something of that sort. I still think that it's better than the alternative of wide open uh, partisan election of judges. In recent years, there's been momentum in some states to do away with merit selection and allow the governor to just appoint judges with legislative confirmation. That has happened in the Court of Appeals for Judges in Kansas, and it's on the ballot this year, that system, in Tennessee. I'm concerned about that because I've seen the high caliber of judges that this process produces in Arizona and other states, but no two merit selection systems are identical and there are ways to tweak existing systems in response to legitimate concerns. We want to ensure balanced and representative nominating commissions and provide transparency and public input in the nominating process for judges. But rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I hope we will consider uh, improving rather than just scrapping all these proposals for merit selection. The Law and Criminal Justice Committee is having a panel discussion later this afternoon that's going to discuss how we select judges in more detail. And the panelists include representatives of all three branches of government, and they'll share their perspectives on the qualities we most want in our judges and how best to select them. I hope maybe if you're interested in this issue, as you, I hope you are, you will join us for that uh, Criminal Justice Committee meeting later today. We expect people who serve in the legislative and executive branches of state government to be responsive to public concerns and to make political decisions accordingly. But however we select them, we expect members of the judicial branch of government to administer justice impartially, deciding the cases solely on the basis of the facts and the law, protecting individual rights and constitutional guarantees, even when the decisions are politically unpopular. It is very important that the public understand this distinction between the judicial branch and the political branches of government. I think in the long term, the solution to politicize, the politicization, if I can pronounce it right, of our courts is better civic education. I think that uh, policymakers and lawyers should all be told about the importance of having fair and um, impartial courts, and they have to come to understand that the rule of law means that judges do have to sometimes take action that the public does not support in a case. And to do that, we have to bring meaningful civics education back into our classrooms. I don't know if you know this, but about 30 years after we adopted the Constitution we have in this country, citizens began approaching state legislatures around the, our new country 
and saying, look, we adopted a wonderful constitution and a form of government, but we need to educate young people about how it works and teach them so that they understand it and they understand how to be part of the process as it goes on. And I think you can see today that we are not doing a good job in teaching young people about civics today. Most states have stopped making civics education a required part of classroom studies in middle school and high school. And two-thirds of Americans, we are told by Annenberg's Public Policy Institute, know at least one of the judges on the TV show American Idol, but only 15 percent can identify the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Nearly three-quarters of Americans can name the three stooges, but that same number does not know the difference between a judge and a legislator. On a recent nationwide civics assessment test, two-thirds of the students scored below proficiency, and not even one-third of eighth graders could identify the historical purpose of the Declaration of Independence, and it's right there in the title. <laughs> now, I think the stat <laughs> The thing that worries me a lot is that only about one-third of Americans can identify the three branches of government, let alone say what each of them does. In the meantime, citizens learn about politics from television ads, primarily. Is it any wonder that we don't have an appreciation for judicial independence and we're quick to criticize any judge that may hand down an opinion that we think we might disagree with. I think we are at this point largely because our nation's schools are no longer teaching much civics education in the schools. And state requirements to do that have disappeared. Our public schools were started to help produce citizens who had knowledge about how our democracy works, who's running it, and how, we, how they're selected, and how we're part of the process. And civics education was the original emphasis for creating public schools. In the 1960s, the typical U.S. student took courses in American history, and in government, and in civics to learn about citizenship and the rights and responsibilities that come with it. Today, you're going to look very hard nationwide to find any civics education going on in our nation's public schools. And we need to bring that back. Not only that, we need to give programs that teach civics a bit of a makeover. Most students kind of find civics classes boring and dull and it tends to be not one of their favorite subjects. Our civics courses, as they're taught, don't seem to be teaching young people that civics is about who we are as a people and how we have an impact on the issues that we care about. And I know that the National Conference of State Legislatures shares these concerns and is working to strengthen civics education in our schools. I'm really impressed by the civic education campaign called Trust for Representative Democracy and for the number of students you've reached through programs like America's Legislators Back to School. Now, I think that's really important, and I hope you will continue that effort. And I hope you will also remember in the process that I've managed to get started a website called iCivics. You know, we have iPads and iPods and iEverything. Now we have iCivics, and it consists of games that young people play to teach them about how our government works and how they're part of it. And many of our nation's states and schools are now participating in the use of iCivics, and I hope you will take a look at it yourselves, www.icivics.org. 
and see if you can't help get it in use. I've managed, by way of contributions made to it, to keep the program free. Schools do not have to pay to use it. And I've spent enormous time uh, to promote iCivics, frankly, because it has lesson plans and all the tools and online games that young people need to learn how our government works and to teach the students about it. And the feedback from teachers and students and the educational community has been very positive. Um, we know that iCivics is being used today in 50,000 classrooms in all 50 states. We have 17 games on the website today, and more are on the way. So I hope you will check it out and encourage its use in your state. And I think you have something called Democracy Kids on a website, and you have an American Democracy interactive game. And I think that's like me preaching to the choir, but maybe it's more a case of great minds think alike. I hope so. But I want to thank you for inviting me to be with you today. And I know you share my conviction that we need fair courts in our country. It's an essential feature of our government. And we need quality civics education in our country. So don't let that disappear from the schools in your state. And I look forward to talking to some of you as we spend time here the rest of the day how we can better promote these goals. And thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really delighted. Thank you.